it's Scott Manley here, and as another beautiful day breaks over the Kerbal Space Center, it's time for a challenge. A challenge which was posted to the Kerbal forums by Andy from uh, Squad PR. She wants players to take a rocket to space using the scenic route. What is the scenic route? The scenic route is to have all the instruments disabled, all the UI overlay, so you can just appreciate the beauty of the game as it is, raw and unprocessed with information which might help you get into orbit. She also suggested that professional players might uh, take it into a polar orbit just to show their skills. I thought that still sounds really easy, so I said, why not use solid rocket boosters only so I have no throttle control? Why not disable SAS so I don't have to, uh, I, I can't control my steering? And, well, why not disable steering altogether? All I'm going to do is push the space bar a couple of times at the right time, and this will get into orbit. Of course, that's because this is how it's designed. <laughs> So yeah, this is an all-solid rocket booster system which doesn't need any uh, control input at all. We have little control surfaces at the bottom. You'll notice that these are passive control surfaces that are only there to keep the whole thing straight. So while this is flying in the atmosphere, it will align along its velocity vector. And you'll notice that as gravity pulls the nose down, we're getting essentially a perfect gravity turn with zero steering losses. I actually throttled back this main rocket a little because otherwise you have to worry about this parachute overheating given the, you know, the high amount of thrust to mass ratio that you have to deal with. It's important to note that this thing will continue to rotate after it passes through the upper atmosphere because it'll have uh, it'll have angular momentum that carries over. Now this whole thing is actually very similar to the Japanese Lambda 4S, which is the smallest rocket ever launched into orbit. Japan, after World War II, were understandably reticent to uh, get into any more armed conflicts. Nay, the government had extreme restrictions on things like missile guidance systems. So when they wanted to launch their first rocket, they basically had to do it without any any guidance system that could be used for a ballistic missile or anything. So the first stage of that was uh, entirely passively steered and the second stage as well. So this is going to fly through and as we go up the only thing that's left is the residual angular momentum. So this will continue to rotate forwards and at some point it will be pointing sideways and we want to fire the second stage engine. Now, it's important to note that the rotation is very slow, and it's not like a circular trajectory, it's a parabolic trajectory, so the rate of turning changes throughout the uh, trajectory. If you launch on a very steep trajectory, you will actually have a very slow rate of turning, and when you reach Apple Apps, you will probably not be facing the correct direction, so you have to account for that. I think I'm getting pretty close, so I'm just going to just watch this here. Uh, going to try and get some real clues as to when this actually goes. Yeah, I think it's not quite there yet. Uh-oh, oh, i am got to fire that. I noticed that it started rotating the other way. I have no idea why that was. I, I hope I didn't touch any control input. I hope I didn't get anything from a joystick or something. Still, I think we're in orbit there. That did not seem right to me. So yeah, I am going to now tr go all the way around the planet. And before I get to the other side of the planet, I'm going to ditch this stage because I've made that mistake before. I have some Sepatrons on here. We have a couple which are facing forwards. And the idea behind these is these will perform a periaps raise maneuver. Uh, it'll, it's not, I won't call it a circularization maneuver because the odds of this orbit being circular are hideously remote. There, we're in roughly the right place. Fire those engines. And... The spacecraft should finally be in orbit, so let's take a look. Let's go all the way around. Nice polar orbit there. We can see everything below us. Yeah, I'm wondering where I should choose to land. I can't tell the atmosphere, but... It, I can't tell the altitude, sorry, but it doesn't look like my altitude is varying by a huge amount. Um, maybe 10%. I, I'm going to say 10% relative to the surface of the uh, the surface of Kerbin. 
Or sorry, sort of, uh, relative to the core of Corbin. So actually, let's come out to the map mode. This is not allowed in the challenge. I'm just show doing this to show you how close the orbit is. 185 by 224. That's 40 kilometers out of an 800 kilometer orbit. That's 5%. That's 0 0.05 eccentricity. I'm going to call that a win. So now we want to return home. And this, again, we got to wait until our spacecraft is pointing the right way. So obviously I don't fire it when I'm facing forwards. I fire it when I'm facing backwards. So that will take a little bit of time. And when we get there, of course, we just have to wait for the right moment. Uh, that's pretty good. Okay, so we get two burns here. That might bring us into the atmosphere too steeply, but I don't care because we have an extra heat shield on this. Because I don't have a huge amount of control here, I use this heat shield, which is normally only required if you're, say, returning from lunar orbit or more distant. If you're returning from low carbon orbit, the heat shield on this should more than suffice. But in this case, I might be screaming down through the atmosphere at velocities which will tax the limits of the heat shield. As such, I have prepared appropriately. Also, the tra trajectory of that rocket does kind of rely on the mass of the upper stage, and messing around with that has the knock-on effect of forcing me to redesign the rocket elsewhere. Yeah, I think I think this is going to be a nice landing here. Going to land in this little lake, like a it's like golf from space, except that the hole is very very big. And this isn't a water trap. This is what we call a water cushion. I mean, I'm sure they call it a water trap in the Soyuz, but they're doing different things. You know, in the US, we, they don't really have many places they can safely land capsules and space hardware unless it's flying like a plane. That's why everything in the US ended up landing in the ocean. Whereas in Russia, yeah, Russia, they had tons of places, tons of planes where nobody lived because they were flat and boring and didn't really have much in the way of natural resources. Uh, or at least natural resources that attract population in the formative years of the civilization. Beautiful! Beautiful! Finally, we have returned home and we can actually take a look at the data. Uh, to our orbit, um, highest altitude, 224, of course. 8.7 Gs. That was probably during re-entry. And so with that, I call that challenge done. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>